Good morning and welcome. It's the final frontier. This is it, baby. Last number, the last stop. It's the end of the series. Sunday Times, Gen Next. The, the conversation's been going on for quite a few months now. Just before the awards, we talk to people who are who we're trying to talk to, the youth, the people who we're trying to market to, also the future leaders of all of these industries. This morning, uh, proudly brought to you by How Train and Yellowwood. They've got an amazing panel this morning. If you would like to have your say in the conversation, whether it's a comment, whether it's a question, you can send through your message right there. Tell everybody you know right now to get part of this conversation. It's going to be a good one. We've got some great people who are going to have a chat with us this morning. Speaking of them, we've got Sia Sanguin. He was a radio personality, superstar, MC extraordinaire. Aria Kelman, who's a CCO and co-founder of Tilt. Zanella Putelua who is a radio personality and a pretty big superstar in the making at the moment, Francois Vivias, who is part of Capitech. He's the executive of marketing and communications at Capitech. And Rufilo Maluleke, who is the managing director of Yellowwood. Good morning and welcome. Let's kick things off. I'm going to start with Zanele. But here's a question. This is for everybody. Yeah. We're talking about marketing. We're talking about cracking the youth market. It's all about the young ones, the money. Mm. That's where it's at. But here's the question. Do the youth actually have a say? Do we actually feature in marketing at the moment? Sure. So this is a very tough one, right? Especially just in terms of where we find ourselves, I think, in life and as the human race. So I believe that in terms of the youth having a voice in general, I think that we're dealing with a generation that has given themselves a voice, right? And by that, I mean that they have platforms in which they are able to express themselves. Be it YouTube, be it TikTok, be it all these different sort of platforms that are at their fingertips. But in terms of them having a voice actually in marketing, I don't 100% know if the youth actually has one, particularly in the boardrooms in and around South Africa. I always see on social media, so many young people are always like, guys, how did you get this marketing strategy wrong? Was it because there wasn't enough young people in that boardroom? Was it because you didn't reach out and actually do your research? So in my honest opinion, I say first and foremost, shout out to Sunday Times Gen Next because I feel like they save a lot of brands in terms of doing the research for them. But I do not believe 100% that we really need to be in terms of so Africa has got a pretty young age average across the board compared to mm -hmm. other parts of the world. South Africa is a little bit on the higher end, but still quite young. The average age yeah. in South Africa is 27. Aria, when you guys are sitting there trying to put things together in terms of marketing, in terms of the youth, do we have a say? Yes, I mean, I think another way to perhaps phrase the question is to say, do the youth have a following, which they absolutely do. They're the most followed individuals on the planet when it comes to social media. Most followed people on social in South Africa, all young people. Um, I think it's the most connected generation and certainly is at the forefront of having the sort of widest range of voice that it's ever had before with the advent of social media, because it's given everybody a sort of broadcast channel. Um, just to kind of counter a little bit of what Zanella says, I mean, I, I walk through a supermarket and I can clearly see the mom and child dynamic when they're in the cereal aisle and the child is saying, I want this. And I see the mom caving into it 99.9% .9 of the time. So I think youth definitely have a voice when it comes to what parents are purchasing for them and for the household. Um, and I think that things like the Sunday Times Gen Next Awards over the past few years and sort of the broader campaign have really spoken to um, unpacking the commercial opportunity of young people in South Africa in terms of swaying their parents and having sort of a share of voice when it comes to what consumer decisions are being made. So I think the youth have an undeniable voice, an undeniable following. And actually, some of the rooms that we sit in, we're a little scared of what the youth are saying about brands just naturally and organically, because they're not speaking about the brands that we're working on. And more importantly than the TVC, it's very often to shift that narrative on social. So I think more than a voice, it's a following, and they are the most followed people in the country. So Aria says there's a massive following. Young people are taking charge in that regard. Zanella believes, mm, kind of, sort of, uh, but do we really have a voice in the boardroom? Rifilwe, I mean, you are part of this initiative of trying to get that information to find out. So we have a following as young people, but do we have the lead? Do we take the lead when it comes to those decisions, when it comes to brands? Do brands sit down and say, yes, top of mind, the youth? So I think there's a lot of interesting um, points that have been raised by both Ari and Zanele. I think, firstly, you know, do youth have a voice? Um, for me, the answer has to be yes. 
Um, and from, there's some structural dynamics behind that, right? So the first one being uh, people are waiting longer to have kids, having fewer kids. Um, and when that dynamic happens, um, you're more likely to listen to what it is that your kids want, what they need, um, and be willing to spend on, which was Ari's point before. I think if you were to look back kind of 50 years where um, the average household would have whatever it is, four or five kids in the South African context, um, you're less likely to pander to the needs of four or five different individuals and rather you and your partner make the decision versus if you only have one or two kids, um, you're far more likely to listen to what it is that they want to do. I think the other structural dynamic around their voice um, is also the fact that they um, have more information than they've ever had before. And they also have um, more, there's more, bigger chance that both parents are working in the household. Um, and when that dynamic happens, there isn't necessarily someone who's spending all their time and energy thinking about what it is that their kids want. And so um, it requires a little bit more independence and a little bit more vocalization of the things that they want to need. Um, and to build on Zanella's point, the fact that they have all of these platforms, all this information, um, they absolutely have a voice in terms of articulating what they like, what they don't like. Um, and to Ari's point about their following, it means that more and more people are exposed to it. The real question for me is whether or not brands listen. And I think that's a different point. I think it is very, very clear that there are brands who listen and reap the rewards and there are brands that choose not to. Um, and uh, we see what happens when brands make that decision that actually, you know, this is a passing fad or this isn't important because it's only teens or, you know, whatever it is, university students who are talking about it. Um, and this real culture of, you know, whatever it is, cancel culture, this, this acceleration towards dramatic responses and kind of really big um, angry responses is, is, is on the rise. Um, and so brands choosing not to listen is absolutely at their peril. Sia, do we have a seat at the table and are we heard? Look, I was just nodding and caught to about to shout amen and what everyone <laughs> has to say, but specifically Rufilo, because I so echo her sentiments. Um, Kenzie, not just a seat at the table, but I think in a past life, I was like a Broadway star because one of my favorite songs right now is from the new Hamilton, and it's called In the Room Where It Happens. And talking about consumers nowadays in the 21st century, I think consumers are more powerful than ever. We might not be at the table, but definitely our voices are heard. Um, so it is exactly as Rafilu was saying, whether or not brands listen. You know, I think we are now living at an, in, a, in a time and a space and an age where you know, it is not like what it was way back when, where brands could just buy our attention, but we are now living in a time where our attention has to be earned. And that is further part of a brand struggle of how you make that happen how you earn our attention and make it worth it. But definitely our voices are, are very, very loud and valuable in this time. Francois, as being part of a brand, uh, the, being the forefront in terms of marketing and communication for a brand that's been voted the world's best bank several times over, do you take in consideration the voice and what's happening around uh, social media, the youth, what they're saying, how they're feeling when you come up with your strategies, with your brand strategies? Do you listen to the brands as Rafilo was, was saying? Definitely, definitely. And I, I wanna agree with everyone on the panel. I think there's some really good and valuable insights. So we, we believe the youth has a strong voice, a better voice now, a stronger voice than ever before. Um, and we definitely try to listen. The, does everyone listen? No, uh, I think a lot of people and a lot of brands still get it wrong. And sometimes we get it wrong as well. I'm more concerned not about the voice of the youth, but about their enablement, about their economic enablement. Um, I'm concerned about the fact that, that we have uh, lower levels of education in the youth market segment now than we ever had before. Um, we have higher in unemployment in South Africa, 33% across the board, but in youth, that's 43% unemployed. So we've got a very strong youth market who are enabled through social media to have a strong opinion, to have a strong voice, and they're shouting loud. And they're um, in, more often than not, not talking to brands, but actually talking on the brand's behalf, which is also a very interesting change in the dynamics, right? We, we don't talk about our brands anymore. Our market does it for us. And a big part of that is the youth. What worries me is that that market, youth market, is... Um, are facing some real challenges. They're facing challenges in terms of education and employment and economic enablement. And at some stage, 
brands are going to feel the pinch of that as well. You know, when you watch adverts from the 90s, it's a lot about emotive. If you watch 80s adverts, it's a lot about bling and cash, right? It's, it's a sign of the times, especially who they're speaking to. In this generation, it's about empathy. It's about living and walking the talk. That's a big part of that. And having social responsibility. That's also another part of how brands feel and how you feel about brands in particular. So Zanele, as a young person, what makes the youth different in terms of how we engage with each other, but also how brands engage with them? What makes the youth different today? Sure. So I think you literally hit the nail on the head when you were saying that it's about accountability, first and foremost, in terms of socially and also just authenticity, I think. When you were saying it's about walking the talk. I think that a lot of young people, first and foremost in today, they, they're not there for the smoke and mirrors. They want you to be upfront with them. They want to know what is what, and they don't need you to put up a whole big show for them. And I think that's one of the biggest things that a lot of brands have, that are getting it right are doing it, that they are keeping true to their identity, but they're also meeting the youth where they are. So one of my biggest things is, first and foremost, the youth of today is 100% looking for brands that are real. And secondly, I also think that with them, there are people who really care about what is happening in the world and people who care about making sure that they're making a change socially. So I remember one year uh, at the Gen Next Awards, it was a very big point, the sense that a lot of brands need to start looking at how they are being socially aware and making a difference because a lot of the youth are now looking to be like, okay, cool. So you guys say you care about this, you care about this community, you care about these people. So what are you doing to show yourself that you're part of it? Even now, I know that a lot of the youth are looking towards brands in terms of, okay, so you know that we have a problem in terms of our employment. So what are you doing about it? Are you talking about it? Are you engaging the youth about it? So for me, those are two very big things. First and foremost, I think that they are people who are not looking for anybody who's going to put on a show for them, but more than anything, be real. And secondly, I think that they are very, very socially aware and they are looking to see who are those brands, what they need them where they are. And another thing for me in terms of meeting them where they are is also just understanding that like we were saying that young people have a voice. So they're on YouTube, they're on this, they're on that, and all of these different platforms. Are brands working to actually be there as well? And are they staying relevant in terms of what they need to be talking about and what they need to be tackling? Zanella mentioned uh, social media areas. Technology is a big part of how we communicate with each other. We're literally on a platform in our houses and our offices separate from each other, but we're all in one space. So how do you develop a youth strategy to target the, mar the, the youth market? Yes, I mean, I think the, the use of the word technology is sometimes sort of thrown around quite casually. Um, and there's a great analogy about a toaster. Um, and, you know, there's, there was a time when the toaster first came out that people looked at the toaster and thought, wow, this thing like evenly spreads the heat amongst the bread. This is amazing. What an incredible advent. This is a piece of technology. Um, for us, the toaster is just every day. It's a thing that's part of our lives. We don't see it as a piece of technology. And unfortunately, I think what's happened is all the people are sort of branding stuff as technology when to young people, that just is the way that it is. I don't know a life without TikTok, without Facebook, without Instagram. For you, this is something new and suddenly it's in your media schedule and your media plan and you've got paid media and digital and an SEO expert and all of these things. And I really have to wrap my head around this as an older person. But for a young person, that just is the way that it is. Um, so I think when, it, when we're looking at, you know, what is the role of technology in developing a youth marketing strategy, um, it's not really saying it's technology, it's saying it's the way that it is. It's looking at the zeitgeist of the time, the culture of the time, um, how people are engaging, and not looking at that as something that is innovative or an advent and we need to plug into it, but looking at it as the way that it just is. So it's native to you. You're born in this era. A cell phone is not technology to you. It's the same thing as it was with us when we were sitting there putting in a floppy disk into a computer back in the day. That was the first time that you were learning. So I, mean, I know you don't know what that is, but it's it was technology back then. Bella, I, you, I, I know. didn't say know what that is. It might be because <laughs> I have older siblings. However... <laughs> Uh, so I think that's an important uh, distinction to make is that technology it might be new and novel is something that's native to someone else and having their voice in there is also something that we can learn from, right? Someone, you'll have a two old who knows how to reboot a, and find a, their way through a cell phone and you're still trying to figure out how to get through the settings. Uh, so Sia, 
how do we use technology? How do we use social media to penetrate you as a brand? Everybody is a brand and can be a brand now where before it was reserved for people with massive budgets. So how do you use that to target as a young person? Well, it's really to look at the benefits of it and how you can start a conversation and mine insights from social media. For a lot of advertising and communication, a, a very long part of it was just a one-way street. I'm telling you what is cool. I'm telling you what you should be into. I'm telling you what I'm selling you. But now it's about having a conversation with your consumers and with your audience. And um, on the insights perspective, it's around really being able to read the room properly when it comes to your audience. Because at the end of the day, whether you are speaking to someone across the coffee table, whether you are broadcasting something, whether you are advertising something to someone, Everybody just wants to know, and it's not a selfish thing, so get that notion out of your head, but how does it impact me? Why do I need to know this? How will it inform me? How will it change my life? What values does it bring to me? So once you're able to mine that from your audience using the likes of social media, you're then able to strike a particular nerve in which you'll be able to bode well when it comes to your forward planning. Well, one thing that hasn't changed, it doesn't matter whether it's the 80s or the 90s, is that information is key, right? And that's where we need to kind of data mine, research, find out what's happening. Rifilwe, you wanted to add a comment there? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I really like that question about technology and particularly Ari's answer to it, because I think um, it is absolutely, um, I guess, much like electricity, something that you, 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 you only notice when it doesn't work. But I think what's compelling and important for brands today to be aware of is because technology is so embedded in everything that we do, um, our expectations, when I say oh, I'm talking about young people, even though I'm not really one of them, um, for young people, their expectations are no longer framed by um, the category that's in front of them. So when I'm dealing with banking, and let's say, for example, I'm on Capitex app, my point of comparison isn't NetBank or Standard Bank or f &B. My point of comparison is apps that work really well. So whether it's I don't know, Instagram or Amazon or whatever it may be, that is my benchmark for what is an acceptable standard of performance. And I think that that's really tough because it means that if you are going to show up in any kind of digital space, um, you have to be able to deliver that kind of seamless, intuitive experience that people are having on others. Otherwise, it becomes this massive point of frustration, even if it's a really, really good piece of technology or something really innovative that you've done, if it's not delivering at all of these other brands that are shaping my expectations, um, you're going to really struggle to, to, to connect and, and, and to build loyalty with that consumer base. Uh, Rafilo, you're too modest. I saw you last week in the line, uh, 35 to 40. I, you're young. Yeah, I saw you in the line to, for your vaccine. So please, girl, please don't come here with your I'm not part of. Megan has a question for the panel. Uh, so the purpose, what purpose-driven brands are on the top of your support list? Uh, so I'm going to start with Aria. So what purpose-driven brands are on the top of your support list, Aria? Sure. I mean, and the past two years have really been the age of what is this brand's purpose. And unfortunately, on the other side of it, you see the marketing managers kind of scrambling, thinking, well, I actually don't know what my purpose is now. How do I find this? No one geared me for this when I was at a university that suddenly I need a purpose and a thing to care about. And unfortunately, what it's resulted in is a lot of brands latching on to something to try and find what this purpose is when actually their purpose was to make money as a brand. That's how they've been geared and conditioned. Now, all of a sudden, I need to check, sort of care about the environment. I need to care about the world in which I live. I need to care about the youth unemployment problem, which is all fantastic things and points to a self-actualization of the sort of marketing and communications industry. But it doesn't happen overnight, right? Because we're dealing with people that have been geared to live from quarter to quarter in an increasingly sort of age of immediacy between us. Um, obviously the go-tos are always gonna be your Nikes and your Doves, um, but I actually don't know if it's worth even necessarily speaking about those brands on a South African platform because we need to be finding our own purpose-led work in SA, in our own South African brands. Um, you know, those hero pieces, we see the Nike thing where we shift from the one edit to the other and everyone's like, oh, that's so amazing. That stuff needs to be coming out of SA. Um, mm. 
And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, um, you know, is coming out of SA and doing incredibly well. If you look at some of the stuff that's won at Can Lion this year, some of the hype magazine work that TBWA did, which focuses on sort of, you know, massive gender inequality issues that we have in South Africa. Um, that stuff is, is all happening. But I think on the purpose piece, um, you know, brands are not going to get this overnight. They're not going to build a 10 year long sustainability program overnight when they're trying to hit their sort of current financials. Um, so the brands that are doing it well are the brands that will always do it well and have always done it well and it served them in seed and that's why they have these long term brands. Um, but I always get nervous of this purpose question because all of a sudden everyone thinks that this happens overnight and, and it really doesn't it requires a lot of introspection from the brands while keeping the clogs moving. So how do you. Francois, as a brand, how do you participate in these conversations around purpose and drive with integrity as a brand? How do you do it? I think the, the key here is to be true to, to who you as a brand and as a company are and have been since the start. Um, everyone, and, and Aria is 100% right, I mean, everyone's scrambling for a, for a purpose. And for some reason, unfortunately, everyone's looking for a noble purpose. They're looking to be seen to make a meaningful change in the world. But the reality is a lot of brands are not based on that. I mean, if you if you think about some of the iconic brands, uh, take Coca-Cola, um, everything they've done is about that, that happiness, that sense of feeling, right? That open happiness or that, that's, that, that goosebumps it gives you when you crack that bottle and goes, Kush. but there's nothing good about Coca-Cola. Uh, it's a sugary drink with caffeine that's you know, terrible for anyone's teeth and, and health. But that's not why you buy it, right? You buy it for, uh, for because they're true to, to who they are and that's what they talk about. Um, and sure, you have, to, you have to make a difference in the world around you, but I think um, no campaign is ever going to solve purpose for you. In fact, people are going to see through it if you try and do some kind of a course-related campaign that is not true to who you as a brand and a business and a company are and have been since the start. And if your business is about designing technology that makes life easy, that's your purpose. If your business is about designing a sugary drink that people love to drink, that's your purpose, right? And, and that's okay. And you can do good work along the way, but do not try and change that suddenly for the sake of being relevant to, to the market, because the, the reality is people see through that. The youth market certainly sees through it and they will call you out on it. Um, I mean, the word authenticity has been thrown around way too many times, but uh, it, it remains true. If, if you can, if you have a clearly defined why in, in a company and in a brand that is not only communicated from the marketing team, but actually lived and embedded in the way the company makes their decisions, in the way you do product design, in the way you do pricing strategies, in the way you do communication, in your terms and conditions, uh, your agreements, if, if the business lives that clearly defined why, uh, and then you could get to communicate it, um, then I think the market sees that and they appreciate it. Uh, but if you, if you are in the unfortunate position where marketing have to come up with a purpose that is not embedded in, in the DNA of a business, you're, you're going to fail. And, I, and as Aria said, that, that is something that you build over many years. It's not something that you pull out of a hat in a workshop session in a couple of days' time. That's an interesting perspective on it. One could argue that a brands like Apple or even Nike don't sell a shoe. They sell a lifestyle. They sell a feeling. They, they sell a vibe. Um, and and I, that's I, I, not key to yeah. necessarily their bottom line in terms of the shoe. I'm selling you the lifestyle. You'll buy the product because it's linked to the product well, that I'm buying. The, uh, the bottom line. Point, uh, yes. Sorry, Fonzo. Yes, please continue. So, sorry about that. Uh, the, the bottom line can never be the purpose. Bottom line is the result. Um, you, if you do good business, you will make good money. But that cannot be what drives the business. Uh, Nike, for instance, I mean, they're known to say that they support athletes around the world and they regard anyone with a body as an athlete. It doesn't matter what you look like, right? Or, uh, or how unfit you are. And therefore, shoes and, and athletics apparel is a big part of what they do, but they also do health apps. They also do uh, a series of other things that add to it. And that's what people buy into. So a lot of people who buy Nike sneakers are not athletes. They're never going to be athletes. But they like what the brand represents and they like the fact that it enables them, right, to... to uh, and I see Sia right, laughing I'm gonna get, at me. I'm going to get to Sia and Zanelli in a moment, but Rifula, <laughs> you wanted to add to that comment. 
you, you, uh, yes, I did. Really. Sorry. Yeah, I did. I think um, I'm, I'm glad that this kind of uh, purpose authenticity conversation has come up because I think it speaks to um, exactly what it, what uh, Francois was saying um, and is definitely what's come out of the Gen Next research that we've done, right? So um, for those of you who don't know, in addition to um, coolest brands, which I'm sure many people on the call are uh, waiting with bated breath to find out if they've uh, topped the list or not. In addition to that, we uh, polled about 7,000 youth across the country to really understand their behaviors, what it is that they're interested in, um, and really give us a sense of um, the why behind the results of the coolest brands. Um, and it really speaks to the conversation we're having now, because the three things that came out of that uh, research in terms of what it is that people look for, young people are looking for in a brand, number one is authenticity. And when we talk about authenticity, it really speaks to the the conversation that um, Francois was raising now. It's this idea of be clear on what is your brand promise, right? The promise that you want to make to all stakeholders, not just consumers. Um, and if your promise is that you will take the complex and make it simple, sorry, Francois, I'm using you because, you know, you're the only brand person on the, on the call. <laughs> if that is if that is your promise, absolutely deliver it in absolutely everything you do, whether it's your products or um, how you communicate or whatever it is, you know, make that your thing. If you're Apple and it's about tools for creativity, how are you providing tools for creativity? And if it comes to your CSI spend, for example, I would be very shocked to see Apple using their CSI spend on malaria um, because I'm not sure what has that got to do with tools for creativity versus, I don't know, helping young people learn how to, um, create their own tools or use tools. And I think that being clear on what is your brand promise um, and delivering it throughout your organization uh, is critical to authenticity. And the reason I wanted to harp on that for a moment is because what your promise should also do is help you say no. And I think that that's the promise that um, uh, Aria was referring to er earlier, that what often happens is that we have this great promise and you know for example one of my favorites is MT right this idea that mm. um you know everyone deserves the benefits of a modern connected life that's amazing that's powerful we do deserve that right but then I would expect them to be clear that there's certain things we're not going to do because it's got nothing to do with um uh, delivering the benefits of a modern connected life and so I'm not going to get involved in certain conversations and I think that that authenticity point um is a is a big one that people um, don't 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 get right um, often because they're not willing to spend the time and you are uplifting the, the the village where I live. Community could be my professional community. It could be my school. It could be maybe I'm a hip hop head and we get together and do something. So anywhere where I feel a sense of belonging and community with the people around me, no matter where that may be, um, are you making some kind of a difference in that community? And I think that those are three points I would love for brands to think about um, as they start to target youth. Sia, you wanted to add a comment a little earlier, Zanella, I'm going to get to you directly after Sia. So what did you want to say around that? Well, I don't know if it's a comment particularly, as opposed to, well, thanks, Francois, I will not be tagging you <laughs> later this afternoon when I go for my run. And I want people to go buy five Ks, okay. Um, but, you know, I, I know it might sound like just banal or like a fleeting phase, you know, and I'm sure you, wherever you are in your rooms um, where decisions are made at, at work, when purpose is brought up and you roll your eyes and here we go again. And Aria hinted at it, when the likes of Nike or, or, or Apple are, are pitched as the benchmark. But I think it isn't so superficial. Um, I think the likes of purpose and a purpose-driven strategy is quite indicative of the times and the sign of the times that we're living in. We're more connected now more than ever. Um, mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the same way someone in Dobsonville is now as equally connected as someone in Atlanta in the US when Kanye West drops a new album and whatever he did with the Donda <laughs> live listening party is the exact same way. It might seem so segmented, but when a Colin Kaepernick takes a knee and you start to see that trickling down at a Pretoria high school, we are more connected than ever. So we're more in, in tune with each other and attuned to what we're all going through. And so purpose is what is going to drive us forward and connects us and binds us more. So I'm sorry, I don't think it's going to be 
a second, a seven second trend, but rather something we do have to factor in, in the work that we do. We are very connected to our cell phones. We also don't really talk to our families because we're on our cell phones, but we're more connected with each other than we've ever been. Like you mentioned now, Sia, because we're having conversations about things that were never part of our world before. Zanella, you wanted to mention something earlier. Yes, please. And I'm going to try to keep this very short. And this might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion, but I do agree with Ari where he was saying that, you know, we do need to, if I'm a brand, you know, like Nike, I need to make sure like what my purpose is over a long period of time and be very sure of it. However, like Sia just said, for me, as a young person, I'm somebody who I always am looking around to be like, okay, cool. How can we make the community better? And which brands are getting that right? So I think two brands that always stand out to me at the moment is firstly Cotton On and secondly, Hollywood Bets, those two brands. And I can tell you this for 100%, it is all because they just partnered up with people. So yes, it's all good and well to have a little bit of a long game and be like, okay, cool, let's find our purpose. But to give some brands a little bit of a cheat code, find somebody who's already doing something and go and be like, okay, cool. You're making sure that young girls have pads each and every month when they go to school. Let's get behind that and let's be about it. And like I said, the reason why I know of Cotton On is because they partnered up with Nomza Mombata. Why I know Hollywood Bits, they partnered up with some other, with some athletes as well. So in the meantime, while you try and work out your own purpose, you can still go out and be part of certain things. And sometimes it's not even necessarily about spend. So let's say it's a tough budget like year or whatever. Go and just amplify it in the way that you can by sharing it on social media, by allowing more people to know about it. So in my eyes, as a young person, I don't necessarily think it's a very difficult thing. I think that it's actually even a little bit easier now for brands to be part of those things because there's so many young people who are already doing it. So you just go and be part of it and allow your brand to, I guess for me, in my eyes, be seen in a different way by the youth. So yeah, that's what I think. So, Anella, you mentioned uh, partnering with people, which opens the gateway to the influencer conversation. So we're going to go into that in a moment. So a question for everybody just to think about in the meantime is partnering as a brand, macro, micro, nano, there's all kinds of influences. How do you get there? What do you use? That, all of that is now part of the conversation. Before it was the people with a massive following. Now people are going with, with smaller uh, unknown, more familiar. That question is going to come through in the next little bit for all of you. But first, Arya, a question for you is, is South Africa fully embracing disruption in the marketing industry? So essentially, are they embracing the youth and the new market opposed to the traditional way of marketing and how things were done? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, the simple truth, if I had to, and I mean, it's very easy to sit on the outside and play Mr. McJudge here, um, but I think no, um, and I don't think it's necessarily um, the marketeer's fault. I think we sit in a sort of marketing space, which is very quarter to quarter at the moment, um, and we don't embrace sort of a sense of failure. You know, I, I've yet to be in a meeting where a brand says, you know what, we're going to allocate uh, 100,000 Rand to this, and there's, there's actually no KPIs, and it's not a brief, it's a business challenge, and we're looking for a business solution. Um, we tend to, and this obviously could just be my sort of experience of it, we live from brief to brief to campaign to campaign versus business challenge, business solution. Um, you know, you see it when big brands change agencies every couple of years, and the same people then just move to the other agency that wins with that wins the work um, because we're very kind of responsive versus sitting down and really looking at something. And I don't think that's anyone's fault. I think that that's the time economy and the pace at which stuff has to happen, right? So I have a new box of X and it's going to be on shelves in Y. Therefore, I need a campaign to promote this thing. Why I've really created this new product, I'm not entirely sure because it kind of came from R&D. It's from that department, but now I just need to market this thing. So I don't think it's anyone's fault, but I don't think that, I think that there's a fear of messing stuff up. And unfortunately, when there's a fear of messing stuff up, people don't produce the best possible thing they could do because they kind of just go with what the norm is. So technology, again, toaster, is it technology, is it not, will force people to now do a TikTok campaign. Um, but they might not be as bold with it um, because they're afraid of messing the thing up. 
So I think, you know, where there's a culture of fear, and unfortunately in our industry, there is a huge culture of fear. I will fire the agency. I will find a new one. I will put this to three people. I will move to the next fiscal. Um, you're not going to get the best out of people. Um, and I think that that's a global problem. That's a worldwide problem. I don't think it's specific to, to SA. But I think we're just a little bit afraid of, of failure. Rufilwe, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, and... Um... You know, I, I'm going to disagree with you a tiny bit, and I'm hoping this fosters a good conversation, um, because I get the sense that, you know, you're being a little unfair to, 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 to marketers. I agree that there's a culture of fear, 100%. Um, but I also think that more and more marketers are taking chances. They are dedicating a portion of their budget to try things that don't always succeed, um, but, they, but they do try things. And I think... Um, some examples in the last, I guess, year and a half or so, um, I think it was really bold of NetBank to do their Money Secrets campaign, right? So for those of you who haven't seen it, basically they made a, a mini movie and covering all the things we're all ashamed about, about money. Um, it had nothing to do with an account. Nobody was talking to you about sign up for NetBank and do this. I think there's some interesting stuff that they've done. If I think about um, the breaking ballet work that was done for the Johannesburg Ballet, um, and of course, you know, Full disclosure, I work at TVWA, so of course I'm, a, uh, I, I'm much more aware of it. But I think there are pockets of bravery um, that are absolutely starting to happen. Um, uh, yes, at a global level, absolutely, we're seeing some really innovative stuff. Um, but also at a local level, I think we are seeing more and more of these pockets of excellence. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that more and more marketers kind of take that mantle um, and try something unconventional because that's um, that's how you, you you connect with young people. And to be honest, you know, and again, I'm a I'm, I'm a strategist, so research is my happy space. Um, a lot of the the research in this Gen X survey, when we talk about authenticity, what it also buys you is that when you do try something and make a mistake, people are willing to forgive you because they're like, hey man. You tried that thing and it's all right because just, you know, you are delivering on your promise in every other way. Um, and as a young person, I'm trying new things every day and I make mistakes. And that kind of vulnerability is something that um, young people connect with because it's not about not making mistakes. It's rather about how you how you come back from that, how you respond to it. Um, and so I'd, I would just encourage marketers, especially those of you who've kind of started this journey, um, to really lean into this kind of disruptive thinking and really be willing to take more chances uh, with your brand. So I mentioned influencers a little earlier and had you all think a little bit about that because that's, that's an interesting conversation, especially in South Africa uh, and also the percentage of people using social media and also marketing and how you penetrate that particular market. So we're going to kick off with Rufilwe from a research perspective. How much is a decision made by the youth in terms of a recommendation from a peer versus an influencer? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, in the, in the GenX uh, behavioral study that we did, um, when you talk about kids and teens, um, the decisions are uh, still quite heavily weighted by uh, parents. Um, but as you start to move towards um, kind of late teens into young adults and young professionals, uh, you do see it, um, that parental uh, advice kind of falling off a cliff. Um, and it does become much more about my peers and influencers and all those kinds of people who um, uh, who influence my, my purchase decision. Um, so yes, absolutely, influencers have um, a significant role to play in, in, in shaping perceptions of your brand. And I think it goes back to the point Francois was raising um, quite eloquently earlier that um, your brand is very rarely what you say about yourself, it's what other people say about you. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing um, when it comes to uh, young people. Yeah, your view on influencers, their role in marketing? Gosh, now that I think you need a Francois hard and fast approach of what exactly are we doing? What are we trying to achieve? What is the bottom line? And what is this person or these groups of people going to add to that? Um, it is, I'm sort of stuck between what Rufilwe has said and what Arie has said as well. Um, there is that um, atmosphere feeling of fear or fear of failure. Um, when brands need to make these sort of decisions around influences. But then I also know that, and being very fair, there are those brands who've experimented and go right out there. Um, I'm a little reluctant every now and then when I see something and I can clearly tell there's a major disconnect between 
person X and brand, or perhaps the buy-in here is simply however much they were paid. Um, I, I don't think there is a blueprint, except I know I sound like that young person on the panel then, but <laughs> what are you trying to achieve? Who are you innately as a brand? Who are you authentically? And how is this person or groups of people going to tie into that authentically? Otherwise, if it is just about a, a, a oh, because person Y has a certain following, or because person Z looks a certain way, then they're going to be amazing for the brand. Everyone is going to see through that and it is going to fall short. Aria, do you go big, do you go small? How do you do it? How do you decide? Do you even use an influencer? Are they still a thing now? Yeah, so, I mean, Tilt is an influencer marketing company. Um, and four years ago, when we were pitching influencers to brands, uh, it was, yeah, they were looking at us like we were crazy. Um, I think that we've reached a bit of a sort of safe landing point in our South African kind of influencer context where now, you know, the budgets are a lot bigger. There's more influencers doing it. Um, there's actually a clutter of it. There's too much of it. Um, but I think it's also how we're defining influencer in our South African context. I think the definition of influencer is Kylie Jenner has her own lip kit. She sells it. It becomes this massive business. That is influence. Influence is not someone holding up the, the toilet rolls and saying, wow, guys, these are really, really great on Instagram. And there's actually been six pictures taken of that because the brand doesn't like like the way the light is hitting the toilet rolls. So I think that, you know, influencer has become a very easily traded word, but we don't really look at the power of it. There are multiple South African personalities that should have their own product lines. The ones that do um, in certain sectors have seen incredible success. You know, someone like Bonang realized a long time ago that she needed to own the thing and that the power was her brand. It was not the six month clear they at and then create sort of proper content around that because people obviously see through it. But the sort of day and age of hold up the toilet rolls and say, wow, these are great. I think, I mean, I, I think we've got to let that go. That can't be what it is anymore. Influence is also not for everybody. Not every brand needs to do it. Sometimes you just need to put the money onto Facebook and Instagram and do the beautiful piece that you shot and tell people this is what you do. Um, so yeah, I think it's become too easily traded and we actually need to pull back a little bit on it. And it's ironic because we run an influencer agency, but I think it's less influences, more long-term relationships and more really like being objective. Like, you know, is this genuinely an authentic fit? I understand this person speaks to the audience. They've got the engagement rate that I require, but like, really, should I be doing this or should I just put the money into paid? Um, and, and I think, yeah, everyone's kind of jumping onto it now, which means it's the end of it, right? When it hits that massive adoption, it means it's over. So you've got to look at the next frontier, which I think is what the Bonangs and the Kylie Jenners of the world are, are doing. Francois. I couldn't agree with Aria more. Um, I think, unfortunately, what has happened is influencers have become this big trend and at some stage, the, the following, the celebrity value, the entertainment value started eroding credibility entirely. Um, and what, so what we've learned as a brand is uh, what is important to us is not the reach and the following of an influencer. It's more important to understand what does that, because an influencer is a brand, not a media channel. What does that influencer stand for? What are their beliefs, their values? And how does that relate to our brand identity, our values, our beliefs? And more often than not, we partner with influencers. And the key word there is partner because it is a long-term relationship. We partner with influencers who are already Capitec clients, who are already Capitec advocates, who already can speak with uh, authority on the matters of money management, as an example. Um, and that is a lot more valuable than partnering with a celebrity status influencer uh, where there's very little of a brand association and, and natural link. The nice thing about Capitec, I know that the last couple of days you've been running that as well. You've asked people between 18 and 30, what made them join Capitec? That's valuable information so you can improve that service. A lot of times brands don't talk to the audience. They just present to them. Well, they just say, hey, this is what we have. I think that engagement is quite important. Speaking of engagement, Zanella, a question from Jess. Are there any young and up and coming influencers or brands or influencer brands that we should be looking out for at the moment? <laughs> Uh, as in particular influencers? Yes. 
Okay, yes, there are so many. So it's actually very interesting to hear Ari say what he said about in terms of, you know, this influencer market, it might even be coming to an end in some sort of way, because um, I, I want to hear more about that. Um, but at the moment, there are people who have such huge, huge, huge bouts of influence in South Africa. Uh, and I also think at the moment, a lot of them are starting to shine quite a bit in terms of how they've been able to leverage it. So for example, if you look at somebody like Kay Yams, she's someone who will be trending in South Africa for a couple of days, all because she decided that she was going to endorse a certain brand just for absolutely nothing. But now people are talking about the fact that because she said it's a good thing, they're gonna go out and go and buy it all because she said it. So from the likes of Kay Yams to Pamela Mtanga, you know, one of the biggest forces at the moment, I think is Michali Ndamase. Then you also look at your Jessica Van Heerdens. And even for me, people such as Paul Clark, they're also people who are coming out very strong. And I also think that, you know, one of the biggest things about them is that they've been able to more than anything, not just work with brands, but then also create this own different culture of theirs in the way in which that they market and change the way that they're starting to do so. So now at the moment, I also see that a lot of the young influencers are now creating, I guess, content that is almost as good as what somebody would create if they were in a studio. And I really think that they're completely changing the game. So for me, just those few people that I've mentioned, and there are a lot more that are starting to come up. So it is quite big. Uh, Rafula, you mentioned that you know brand promise resonates a lot and it's quite important in terms of your messaging out there. Um, how do you leverage that? How do you use that in terms of marketing uh, with regards to the research that's been gathered? Um, I'm not sure I've understood your question entirely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you asking about, you know, how is it that you use your brand promise in your marketing efforts? Yes, yeah, so a question coming in from the audience. So essentially being a central part of how you operate in marketing, brand promise is a key part of that. So how do you leverage that? How do you use that to actually get your message across? Sure. So, I mean, I think the the, the first thing is to define it, yeah, which I know sounds a bit, um, you know, simple-minded, but that's the point. You've got to articulate it and be clear on what is this uh, single-minded promise that you as a brand want to make uh, to your audience. Um, and yes, of course, deliver it through your entire business. But when it comes specifically to marketing, find ways in which um, to make sure that you are delivering it inside your, your, your marketing, right? Um, so as an example, um, if I take uh, Savannah, um, you know, they've always been around this kind of uh, dry humor. It links back to their product because the product is dry, et cetera. So is this idea of kind of lightening the moment through, through, through something that is quite dry. Um, and yes, that extends to the um, advertising that they do, um, but it also extends to how they use influencers. And if I go back to Ari's point, you know, I think um, one of the most um, compelling influencer campaigns that I would have seen over the last year or so is this, right? So, so working with Cinema Kangube and a whole lot of other influencers to really mock influencer culture, yeah? Um, and, and that kind of, that moment of like opening up the toilet paper and being like, oh, how amazing, this is the best thing in the world. It's completely on brand for them, 100% on brand. I think the people that they've chosen are people who have um, their own kind of brand that kind of aligns to them, which is the point that uh, Francois was making. Making. Um, and so that, that's really what it's about. Define your single-minded promise that you want to make uh, to, to, to your audiences. Um, and of course, make sure the back office is intact. Make sure your products and everything deliver against that promise. But when you get to marketing, evaluate every piece of communication, every brief, every uh, creative idea through the lens of that promise. Is it delivering against that promise that you've, um, that you've defined for yourself as a business? Sanella, you're hosting the Gen Next Awards. What are you looking forward to the most this year? Oh my goodness. First and foremost, I look forward to the Gen Next Awards every single year, uh, mostly because I feel like there aren't any, or rather there aren't enough platforms that literally listen to the youth. That's why I appreciate the Gen Next Awards so much. Um, but this year, I'm very, very excited because, you know, I think that one of the biggest things about the Sunday Times Gen Next Awards is that they keep up with what the youth is all about, right? Because that's the core of who they are. But in doing that, of course, we find ourselves second year in the pandemic. So we've brought along a whole lot of different sort of categories that are coming along with the ones that have been here for a very long time. But for example, we're adding this year 
best alcohol, which of course was voted for by 18 years and older. It was also the best learning platform that was added because we're learning from home. Um, and there's a few others that came along as well because you know everybody's been having a staycation. So of course there had to be the best leisurely places that you could possibly stay at. And I definitely think that in just looking at things like that, I'm very excited for everybody just to be exposed to just how much Sunday Times Genetics has kept up with what the youth is getting into right now in this pandemic, and also just for the youth to be heard once again. I think that's the most important thing. And I also feel like it's always such a great pointer for so many brands to see who's getting it right and what you can do to then allow yourself to be seen and also for you to possibly hear what the youth have to say. Ronsa, what do you think the new youth consumer looks like in 2021? That's an interesting question. I, I, um, I don't have a crystal clear picture. I don't think what has changed as much in terms of what the youth uh, aspirations are. I think you know we're going to see a lot of the same things that 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 the youth want. What are what is going to be interesting for me to see out of the research? Um, I would be quite curious to understand what the impact of the past year and a half of COVID and lockdown has been on this market segment. Um, there are a lot of people who are at key points in their development, whether whether it is at school or university, uh, exposure to social communities, to sports development, education. Those are the defining moments in your life that, you know, to some extent create the, the foundations on which you build your career and the rest of your life. And that has been impacted severely at a, at a not just a financial level, but especially a social level. And I, I think it's be interesting to learn out of the research if there has been any in, insights um, and, and whether we need to talk to the youth today differently because of what they experienced in the last year and a half. Um, what I do think, though, is, uh, you know, it's always interesting to see that some of the strongest brands in the world uh, among the youth are not targeted at the youth. Uh, in fact, and, and maybe that's something that we, we often get wrong. We talk about the youth as if they are a tightly defined market segment, but really it's just young people with, a, with, with certain needs. And ultimately, it is about whether your brand can meet them where they are at, whether your brand can speak to yes. what their needs are, whether you fulfill um, something in that, that is important in their life, uh, and, and whether you are relevant. And that's what it is about. So I'm keen to see what comes out of the research. In terms of the research, Rafilwe, your thoughts on uh, Francois's comment there? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point, Francois. And, you know, what uh, we have seen, because this is the first time we've conducted the research um, in the midst of the uh, pandemic. Uh, last year, we did, we went into field before lockdown happened. Um, and, you know, what's happened is really not so much a change in who they are, but more an acceleration of trends that were kind of bubbling under in any event. Um, and, you know, to kind of answer your question in a more succinct way, um, you know, the space that young people are in right now, um, their context is actually quite chaotic. Um, enormous amount of uncertainty, enormous amount of anxiety. Um, the institutions and people who are meant to be trusted and protect them have failed quite spectacularly in many ways. Um, and so there's this um, really surprising level of, 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 of heightened anxiety that comes out across all the different groups we looked across. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, data points that we found was when we were asking them, what are they most afraid of? Um, you know, the first one was generic across everyone around losing a parent, which we can all identify with. Um, but for girls, the second most um, thing that they fear is around being sexually abused. Um, and that has got to do with, again, the chaos and, and uncertainty of what's happened yeah. um, over the last, I guess, uh, year and a half or so. Um, and what we found is that what they are looking for when it comes to engaging with brands and um, back to the point you made earlier, brands are not just businesses, they are people, they are institutions. What they want are people who are going to play a meaningful role in addressing that complexity. So yeah. are you helping me understand it better? Are you helping me navigate it? Are you helping me find some kind of respite, like a bit of peace, a bit of enjoyment? Um, and so I think when you view your brand in this really difficult context that they are living in, you've got to think about um, how are you making their lives a little bit better in that context. And again, it doesn't always mean something super worthy, like you're going to educate every single young person in the country. Um, finding spaces for enjoyment, 
is, a, is something really compelling. Finding ways to let them safely explore their identity because they don't have that anymore. That they, are, they don't really have the ability to be spontaneous, to be like, hey, homie, let's meet at Santa and we'll take it from there and we'll yeah. see what happens. Those things are not an option. So giving them spaces and platforms to explore their identity, to be spontaneous in a really safe, risk-free kind of way um, is, is a hugely compelling offering. So I think if you view young people in, in this unnatural world that they are living in, um, just be sure that what the role your brand plays is relevant inside of that context. And I hope that kind of gives you a feel for what is coming out of the, the research. Uh, on the back of that, we're going to wrap things up in a moment, but I'm going to kick it off with Ira. Innovation is an important part of marketing, especially with an ever-changing market and the youth and things changing all the time and new apps and new things that are being introduced all the time. So how important is a brand to be innovative when they're targeting this market? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is in the question. You kind of, if you want to achieve success, you have to, to go with the flow. And again, don't look at it as innovation. Just look at it as the way that it is and try and plug in authentically to that. All right. The last 30 seconds for everybody. You're going to start with you, Zanele, because we like to start at the, with the, the last letter of the alphabet. Uh, <laughs> so for you, uh, one thing that you would say to marketers out there in terms of the youth? I think one of the biggest things that was on my mind coming into here and also just in terms of what Francois just said, uh, where he was noting the fact that some of the biggest brands around the world aren't necessarily talking to the youth. I think for me, the reason for that is because it is those brands that have the strongest brand identity and they see how they can then fit into the lives of young people. They're not trying to mold themselves towards what they think young people want, but they're saying, this is us. Hey guys. And they present themselves. And that's what I think. As long as you have a strong brand identity, you then present yourself to the young people and make sure that you do it to them and you meet them where they are. From the last letter of the alphabet to the first letter of the alphabet, Aria, uh, what takeaway do you have for um, a business out there in terms of marketing? Yes, I think when it comes to youth, it's very simple. I would just download TikTok, to be honest, and spend an hour and a half on there um, and actually just get a sense of what kids are creating. It's off the charts. Uh, I mean, if you are an art director, I'd be petrified right now because these kids are doing the DOP's job, the art director's job, the strategy job. They're doing the sound recorder's job. They're doing everybody's job and producing this incredible content. So I think it starts with actually just engaging on the platform where the kids are at. Um, so yes, that is my big takeaway. Spend an hour and a half on TikTok and then delete it. Otherwise, you're probably going to spend the rest of the day and the coming weeks on there as well because it's addictive no matter what age you are. Uh, Francois, see a refill away. Francois, your 10 seconds. What's your takeaway? Thanks. Uh, um, I like what Refilway said earlier about communities. Uh, and I think that's, that's probably the place where brands need to be active most is to understand where young people are meeting each other at and to become, become relevant in their conversations rather than to try and talk at them. And I think that's something that we all need to spend time on and maybe TikTok is the way to get started. See ya. Well, firstly, I just want to say kudos to the whole Sunday Times Gen Next team and Yellowwood for their concise and apt research to prove how apt the research is. When Rafina is rattling off those stats, I'm like, was she listening to my therapy session about anxiety, <laughs> about fears? I'm like, wait, it's way too real. So, it, you know, Sunday Times Gen X is probably such a stellar, stellar event. And it's a way in which you get tangible insights, get real information. You know that good old adage, life is what happens while you're busy making plans. Well, I think in this context, um, real engagement and real culture and real conversation is what happens while you're busy in your boardrooms creating strategies. So really listen to the kids, bro, and that will guide what you get to do. And the Sunday Times Gen Next team is exactly there to help you do that. Rafila, you've got the dots, but tell us one thing that <laughs> is a takeaway. Um, honestly, it's a reflection of what everybody else says take the time and energy to really understand them. Um, assume that you know nothing um, and approach it with an open mind and whatever it takes, the resources, the energy, put it into um, understanding young people before you start making decisions um, based on your preferences. 
Thank you to our headline partner, How Train, our research partner, Yellowwood, media partner, Cliff Central and Arena Events for putting all of this together. Thank you to our panelists, Zanele, Francois, Arie, Sia and Rufilwe for being part of this. Also a special mention to all the guys behind the scenes, to Courtney, Tanya, Jade, Taryn, Gananello, Amara. All of you guys have been amazing throughout this entire series. The 9th of September, it's going to be a beautiful day, 11 a.m. Zanele is going to be there. Bye -bye taking care of business and uh, you can register www.sundaytimesgennext.co.za it's going to be an interesting night as it always is interesting morning as it always is so see you there have a fantastic day bye bye the kids are all right <laughs>